Hi, and welcome to Prepping Essentials. Good morning, it's 7.15 on Saturday the 3rd of October. Just making my way down to the land. As always, not quite sure what we're going to get done today, particularly given the weather, but let's find out. Well, here we are, down on the land. A very wet piece of land this morning. Uh, as was predicted in the forecast, unusually. Uh, we have had several days now, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, overnight into today, of wet and windy weather. Quite a bit of standing water on the road as I came in this morning. And uh, underfoot I can hear. Uh, how wet the field is but not to worry uh, we do need it I'll certainly need it to top my uh, rainwater harvesting tanks though I suspect <laughs> they're probably overflowed already I really do need to get some more tanks installed at some point anyway as usual I'll get myself into the cabin get opened up uh, definitely there'll be a fire going on this morning and then we'll get the polytunnel opened up and uh, see what's happening with the, the plants and vegetables. Well, first things first, <laughs> let's get that fire going because it is miserable out there this morning. <clears throat> Hopefully that'll be done in a couple of minutes. Uh, the rain, thankfully, <clears throat> has more or less stopped. It is just kind of spitting, uh, so I'll get the polytunnel opened up and we'll take a look at the uh, the garden while we've got the chance to not get wet doing so. Well that's the polytunnel opened up, we'll have a quick whiz round. Uh, mixed bed, pumpkin and squash, <coughs> trying to spot these. <laughs> we've got one down here which is not a bad size. We've got this larger one here. <clears throat> I did say that uh, I thought that was going to uh, stop growing because the uh, the actual plant runners themselves are uh, died back. I might just leave it another week. The old original one here. And to be honest, that's about it. Uh, everything else is just kind of plant, leaf and flowers. It's still flowering, I can't believe it's still flowering, but it is. Just not producing a great deal of anything. Uh, true smart shocks have died back now. Uh, they must be due lifting shortly. We might do that next weekend. See how the weather how hands up. <laughs> Potatoes, really pleased with these. These have done really well. Um, no sign of flowers yet, but I guess it is a little bit early for that. But <clears throat> clearly we're going to get something out of that this year before Christmas. Um, the other two barrels, they've just got some cauliflower plants in. Um, though in this one, I did actually chance my arm and uh, there are some potatoes in here uh, so you, know, you never know fingers crossed we might see something uh, this first bed beetroot I'm going to definitely take one of those today just to have a little look and see what's happening with those but clearly they have done well unlike <laughs> the cauliflowers which disappeared I mean you can see there are just lots and lots of holes in this everywhere you look pretty much uh, something's been chewing its way through big hole down here in the corner so that needs a bit of a rethink for next year uh, middle bed cauliflowers doing quite well actually remains to be seen whether we'll actually get anything or not garlic doing well those little couple of stray uh, onions also doing well. 
carrots. Uh, these, this pot here is one of the original ones. Uh, they really could do with being lifted, but it's a bit wet. So I'm not quite sure whether I will or I won't do that today. Uh, and the late ones that went in, really nice strong growth on those. So I will definitely be getting, um, what was this, four full buckets and a part bucket uh, to come. Onions also doing well. In terms of the uh, two pumpkin squash beds, this squash bed here, still putting out flowers, just distinct lack of fruit. Um, there were a couple of small ones kicking about somewhere. Can't remember where they were now. I know there's some in the middle bed. Yeah, they're not doing well at all. They just seem to be dying off on the on the plant. I don't think that they've been pollinated. Um, so it looks like we're only going to have this one uh, round here. Yeah, there it is. I think we're only going to end up with just that one, unfortunately. But, yeah, we'll see. Pumpkin doing slightly better, although it is still being chewed by the rabbits. Another one down here, again chewed by the rabbits. And again, round here, that's the bigger one. And that is quite sizeable, actually, that. And another one here that just does keep getting chewed. That's, that's fresh chew marks. <laughs> so all in all, raised beds have done well this year as a, uh, a first year. Certainly lots of lessons learned for this, which I'll be carrying forward into uh, plantings for next year. Polytunnel itself, not a great deal going on in here. These uh, tomato forests I've got going on, still putting out lots and lots and lots of flowers. Everywhere you look there's flowers, but uh, sadly that's not been backed up by fruit. I have picked uh, quite a few tomatoes off here to be fair, far more than I originally thought I was going to get. But clearly for the volume of plant, nowhere near where I should be getting. There are still some... Uh, tomatoes buried in here. I forget where they are now. Oh, there we go. So we have still got fruit coming on a couple of the plants, but uh, in fact there's a, there's a ripe one there buried in the back. Overripe actually. <laughs> uh, but yeah, nowhere near where we should be with that. Um, what we got? Cranberry, not a lot going on there now. I think we've passed its best now this year. And it has still got that other plant growing in there, despite my best efforts to get it out. Blueberry, nice, doing well. <laughs> the squash, nothing. The cucumber um, is still producing fruit, actually. We still do have, and I've picked quite a few off here. We still do have fruit. Um, peas. I keep picking those, <laughs> to be honest. There are still a couple left. Um, and that new plant, which is, uh, it thinks it's spring. <laughs> uh, the rest of it's as it was, strawberry plants. You can see they're starting to turn now in colour. So we're heading towards the end of the year with those. Hopefully they'll go into hibernation and I'll have lots and lots of plants for the new year. Bigger blueberry bush. Has done well this year, did produce fruit. Uh, I think now it's also realising that uh, the end of the year is here. So that's about it. Garden and polytunnel. Um, water tank needs topping up. Uh, thankfully I don't need to do anything outside because it's raining again. Uh, but I might just pluck the odd onion and beetroot and maybe the carrots. But first things first, I want to get myself back in the cabin. Looks like the fire's uh, taken, so I'll get myself settled down in there, get a bit of a warm and a cup of coffee, I think. Yep, that fire's well away now, so I'll get some, uh, some more wood popped 
left on there and that can settle itself down that's looking very nice it should like keep me nice and toasty warm while I sit with my coffee well it's it's nice to be inside with the uh, the old wood fire going and a cup of coffee. It is uh, cold, damp and I was going to say miserable but actually it's never really miserable down here no matter what the weather. Uh, the weather does stop you doing things outside for sure but uh, eh, there's plenty of little jobs that I can be doing in the cabin. Uh, it won't be a long video today. I've got to disappear off to a, uh, a birthday. So we won't get uh, too much excitement for you in this video. Uh, I will try and pull a few plants up though before I go just so you can see uh, the beetroot and the carrot. But I thought I'd do another little uh, cabin chat. Um, looking at the comment section. Uh, people do seem to find them beneficial, which is the whole point of this channel, actually. Um, it's not a, uh, a fame trip or a money-making trip for me, because <laughs> neither of those applies. You can see that from the subs. Uh, but it is just my way, I guess, of, of trying to have a bit of thought-provoking uh, comment for people who uh, either either just getting started or are, are trying to um, keep the momentum going with the prepping and the prepping lifestyle. wasn't quite sure what to chat about today. <clears throat> I've done quite a few videos over recent weeks on quite varying topics. Um, but looking at kind of the news reports and whether or not we are going to have um, this big economic crisis, which I'm 99.9% .9 sure we're already in, <laughs> let alone are we going to have it or not. Um, but also the potential for civil unrest in different places around the world. Uh, I see in the news that Hong Kong has reared its head again. Um, you've still got protests going on in Belarus. I went to um, visit a friend of mine. Hi Neil, if you're watching, <laughs> he's never even seen my channel up until uh, two days ago. Um, so hopefully he is still looking. Um, yeah, I went to visit him the other day. Uh, I used to work with him uh, overseas. And uh, we were just having a bit of a chat about the state of different countries. Um, and I don't know whether you're aware or not, but um, Azerbaijan on the Caspian Sea. Um, an old um, cultural and political uh, unrest has risen its head again um, and they're almost verging on, on civil war. Um, there are bullets flying and bombs dropping uh, as we speak um, and that's not very far away from uh, mainland Europe, not far at all. Um, <clears throat> American Cousins, still quite a little bit of unrest going on there, uh, but the big news I guess today, um, actually it kicked off yesterday, is um, President Trump and COVID-19 testing positive for that. Um, fingers crossed that it's a mild case and doesn't get uh, more serious, but it kind of just goes to show it doesn't matter who you are and what your political stances or how much money you've got um, it, it can affect anybody, literally anybody um, nobody is immune so lots of stuff going on general unrest in the background um, and it does kind of reinforce the prepping message I guess that you should be ready for for anything and for normal life to, to stop um, whether that's short or long term, 
um, and be ready to be able to sustain yourself until <clears throat> things go back to normal or we <laughs> we go into a brave new world um, that would be interesting um, so in terms of topic for today um, there is a never-ending debate in the prepping community as to what you should do or shouldn't do in the event that uh, a major something hit the fan scenario occurs um, do you stay in your home shelter in place and try and ride it out or do you grab your bug out bag jump into whatever vehicle or form of transport it is that you have and uh, disappear off to your bug out location or back location homestead whatever you want to call it um, depending on which side of the prepping fence people come down on because even preppers have big differences in opinion um, will depend on which of those options you take and it's not quite as straightforward a decision as it might seem um, I think the the number one option would generally be to shelter in place because in your home your everyday home everything that you need to sustain yourself is going to be there it's already set up and uh, all you need to do is open the cupboard door and there are your preps ready and waiting um, so it does make sense to try and shelter in place um, and ride out whatever it is that's that's occurring however having said that it is absolutely going to depend on what the scenario is what crisis event has happened um, if we take this most recent crisis that we're having right now the the COVID-19 pandemic um, then yes it would make absolute sense to stay where you are the the grid hasn't gone into total collapse there was a little bit of a disruption but only for a matter of a couple of weeks the disease itself although tragically people have died um, and again there's a debate <coughs> around the figures and whether people did or didn't die of covid setting that aside um, even on worst case scenario statistics um, the mortality rate the kill rate of the disease is actually very very low it, it is on a par with more traditional uh, and common illnesses such as flu um, so in the case of covid it, it makes absolute sense to stay where you are there is no pressing need to get out uh, of the normal population um, and go to your bug out location um, there would have been a case had it been a more um, deadly disease if it was for example Ebola which has a I don't know 90 odd percent kill rate if it had been that then yes it would have made sense to get well away as far away as you can from the population um, because even with the best precautions there is still a chance that you could fall ill and spread that disease within your wider family or prepper group um, so it is really scenario dependent um, clearly there are some scenarios where there wouldn't even be a debate as to whether you were leaving or not and they would generally be around the, the big natural disaster scenarios say for example you're in California recently and a wildfire sweeps through and burns all of the houses clearly at the first sign of that um, it would make sense to go straight away um, similarly other natural disasters floods earthquakes uh, and such like again um, at the first sign 
Um, and you generally do get advance notice for these things. Um, they don't just suddenly turn up at a minute's notice. They build gradually and with the technology nowadays, uh, weather forecasting services can pretty accurately predict the track of these big storms that come through. So again, you would have some kind of early warning and again, it would make sense um, as a precaution just to get out um, until the event has gone through and you see what you're left with, whether your normal home has survived or not. Um, gets a little bit more tricky in the case of um, economic collapse or civil unrest. Um, it does depend, I guess, on the um, degree of the incident itself, how severe is that <clears throat> and how quickly evolving is that. So if we take current events as an example, although there have been not so much here in the UK because we've, we've been fortunate I guess over the years that we don't really have these major civil unrest um, incidents kicking off we'll have the odd small scale protest riot whatever you want to call it but we don't have anything on a huge scale like say hong kong or some of the incidents we've seen in the in the us um, but it does depend on the nature so if it's a small scale slowly evolving unrest shall we say then it would make sense to shelter in place in your normal home and the same would go for economic collapse as well. If you're into a, a, a big recession, um, the services of the state and the supply chain uh, of the grid isn't really going to collapse straight away. It might over time if this scenario evolves and gets bigger and bigger and bigger over time. Um, so again, initially it would make sense to shelter in place. However, were uh, was the degree of the incident to evolve and start to evolve more rapidly and become uh, bigger more quickly. So you did see rioting in the street where you are over a sustained period and it became clear that the authorities weren't able to control that, then yes, um, it would make sense to, to leave. And I'll just caveat all of that shelter in place um, by saying this, there is a, a very fine line um, to be drawn as to when you would need to leave. As I said, in some cases it will be clear quite quickly, um, in others it might not be. And there is an inherent danger there in that if you leave it too long, it might not actually be possible then for you to leave without um, presenting yourself with quite significant danger. Um, well, let's give some examples and I'm just winging this, I'm making it up as I go along. <laughs> I say that in pretty much every video, don't I? Um, if we took, say, civil unrest um, as, as the incident uh, general breakdown in rule of law. Um, you could sit there for weeks or perhaps months just watching the news reports and it's, uh, it's some city away from where you are and then it gradually starts to move and it comes into your city and it's small scale to start with. Um, you are going to have to think carefully and try and predict when your last window of opportunity would be to actually get in your vehicle and get out to your bug out location because <clears throat> there will be a tipping point and uh, you may well find that when you make your decision to leave you're competing with lots of other people who have been doing exactly the same as you they've been sheltering in place they've got their provisions there Apart from going outside, perhaps their routine of life has stayed stable and they're able to continue with a pretty much normal existence within the home. Um, but they may have reached the same conclusion as you at around the same time. And you might find that it is difficult, physically difficult, because of blocked roads, 
um, to get out. And similarly, um, once you're outside your home, your main layer of security is gone. Anybody who is mobile, it doesn't matter whether it's on foot, on a bicycle, in a car, in a truck, once you become mobile, um, you've kind of removed your outer layers of, of security that you would have had in your home. And that presents you as quite a vulnerable target. Um, you're going to have to work your way through all of this unrest as you work your way out of the area where you live and the area where the unrest is and eventually get out into a more rural and uh, uh, unaffected area to head to your borough application. Um, similarly, you might find that the government takes that option away from you and we've seen that in a fashion with the coronavirus uh, crisis. Um, in order to try and maintain control of the general population and to maintain some form of normality of operation of the grid itself and rule of law itself, um, government might impose restrictions on travel. So you, you could start to see lockdowns, curfews, you could see troops deployed on the streets, um, bans on general movement and certainly bans on movement outside of your particular town or city. And we've seen that um, with COVID-19 all around the world. Governments have decided to impose travel restrictions. People can't leave the country or can't leave their state or region or indeed can't leave the town that they live in and come 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night, whatever it is, complete ban on travel, um, ban on social gatherings, no more than groups of, as we are in the UK now, six. Um, so there is, a, <clears throat> there is a danger inherent with sheltering in place or locking down in your home to try and ride out whatever crisis it happens to be, in that you might be overtaken by events and um, you suddenly lose that option of, of bugging out. The next um, <clears throat> topic, I guess, within this is bugging out itself. And the primary factor when considering whether you would or wouldn't bug out is where would you go? <laughs> it's, it's all well and good to say, oh, I'll just grab my bag, jump in the car with a load of boxes of food and water and whatever else supplies you need. And I will just go. Um, go where is the burning question. Um, you need, once, once you leave your home, you, you need another home, an alternative place to call home and to re-establish all of the normal home um, supplies and services. Um, there are a few of the more exotic prepper channels who uh, focus on bushcraft and survivalism um, who will say, yeah, I'm just going to disappear off. I've got my bag with all my things in it. I'll go to a remote rural location, middle of the woods, up on a mountain or wherever um, and I'll just I'll just do survivalist uh, and I'll build shelters and I'll create something out of the wilderness. Um, yeah good luck with that. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not as simple as it might seem uh, to create a sustainable living environment um, out of nothing uh, in the wilderness. It's, it's, it's just a pipe dream, I'm afraid. Um, yes, I guess over a substantial period of time, you could, if you had the right equipment and uh, resources at your disposal, create something. Um, you could build a cabin in the woods, but as I've kind of proven here, um, it's taken a year to put up a cabin which um, 
it's livable now for sure um, but an awful lot of work has gone into that and if you've been viewing my channel for any length of time you will know that assistance has been required i've had to bring in supplies of materials to construct the cabin uh, from time to time i've had to bring in physical labor support to help me to build construct move materials where it's just been physically impossible for me on my own to do that due to the size of, of the materials being handled or the method of construction. Uh, if you've got an eight foot beam of wood <laughs> that needs framing up, um, actually you do need somebody on each end of that beam um, whilst you attach it to the framework. So yeah, um, solo, wilderness survivalism um good luck with that um i don't wish anybody any ill but um i would urge people if that's the mindset to just have a little bit of a think as to the sustainability of that for the longer term and i'll kind of revisit that theme in a minute so yeah somewhere to go to um if you did have to leave your home due to the crisis, it, your home became unviable, whether it was destroyed by the, uh, the incident itself or whether it was coming under attack and in danger of being overrun and you yourself and your family were in danger, physically threatened, um, then yes, you need to bug out and the burning question is where to go to. Now there are a few different things to consider i guess not everybody will have the luxury of having 20 acres in the woods or in the mountains with a cabin already there um it's taken me forever to get my very small 1.6 acres and then it's taken me best part of a year to create some kind of sustainable infrastructure um, and it's cost a lot of money as well. Um, so not everybody is going to be in that kind of position. Um, so I guess then you're into looking at living out of portable buildings, tents or vehicles, or perhaps um, adopting or acquiring some kind of existing structure somewhere that is not being occupied right now. Um, there are lots of disused buildings um, scattered around any country that you would look at really. Um, there are plenty of open spaces where there is no population that you could go and start to set up. So you could start with your vehicle, or you could start with a tent or some other kind of portable, portable uh, shelter. And over time, yes, you could construct something um, in a proper full-blown grid down crisis scenario um, it's unfortunate but people are going to die it's a fact of life uh, people will abandon um, areas where they used to live to try and find somewhere um, safer or just to move where there are more resources and it's physically easier to sustain yourself so over time um, shelter and bug out locations will present themselves um, what previously couldn't be occupied because there were people already there in occupation will over time become available as those people disappear whether that's through voluntary relocation bugging out or through death or dispersal by other means so they get driven out by the hordes or government mandates and clears an area or whatever um, so places will become available i guess the trick really if you don't have somewhere of your own is to take a look around decide yourself where you think the safer areas would be in the event of a major crisis and do a little bit of research and just figure out could i go there and if i could go there what would i need to take with me 
and what's available in that environment to create something that's sustainable in terms of long-term shelter. Um, so if you don't have somewhere already, then have a think about where you would go. And there's a whole range of different things to look at. It's probably another video's worth of things to look at that you would need in order to become sustainable, self-sufficient in your new location. Indeed, if you scroll back through my videos and look at what I've needed to put into place here at the cabin, that will give you an idea of what to look for in a potential bug out location and things that you might need to uh, take with you or acquire locally in that area. Um, I did say I'd revisit the subject of bugging out um, and when to do that and kind of pitfalls. The biggest issue you're going to face with any setting up of a new location when you do bug out um, is the resource factor and the main resource factor is is people um, as I've kind of alluded to already in this video trying to do something yourself to construct a cabin to dig a well or a pond or to um, set up a water system or to set up a, a self-sufficiency garden um, <clears throat> if you are on your own um, it's extremely difficult and you only have these two hands um, and quite often two hands to do a task isn't enough and also the amount of work required for one person um, it's not sustainable you you will for sure burn out things that normally are able to be done quite quickly do take longer when you're not in your comfort zone, you're not in your home environment, you're in the middle of a field or a wood. Um, so you also need to think about who you're going to have with you when you bug out, because for sure one person uh, isn't enough. Um, if you think about all of the things that you would need to do day to day, it's just part of your normal survival routine let alone survival <clears throat> routine in the middle of a crisis, um, you're going to need to do some kind of construction and maintenance on your shelter. Um, you are going to have to source and then um, cook meals three a day. You're going to have to source water. You're going to have to do the general maintenance personal hygiene regime, all of the things that you kind of take for granted in the home and you have the facility there to do um, are not going to be the same in a bug out location um, unless of course you've got a ready-made ready house or cabin sitting on it uh, but even then <clears throat> you have to perpetuate that, you have to keep that going, maintain it on a daily basis um, and it will become a physical challenge to do that and not only that, whilst you're busy trying to maintain service as normal uh, in your bug out location, the crisis is still going on. So the issue of personal security becomes a massive priority. You can't be there tending your vegetable patch or digging your well or doing whatever else it is you're doing. Um, without constantly 360 degree checking around you for danger because there will be lots of it um, whether that's natural dangers in your environment whether or, or, or wild animals or whether that's from the crisis event so people out from the towns and cities moving out to the countryside foraging for food mainly or for supplies or looking for a place themselves to bug out and they'll be eyeing up your place and wanting to take that over. So you, you, security will be a major factor so one person physically cannot do that. You are going to need a group of, of individuals all looking out for each other and sharing all of those different tasks including that security task which will be vital in a major 
crisis scenario. Um, so lots of things to think about in terms of bugging out. Where are you going to go? What resources do you need there in place? What resources do you need to take with you? And who's going to go with you in order to provide that support mechanism to sustain everybody in a, a, a in an environment of safety and security, um, you are definitely going to be at risk, no matter where you go to. Um, in any major crisis event, when the system collapses, um, it will be mass migration from the towns and cities because the resource there will dry up, the personal security situation there will become untenable, and people will naturally expand out and will be looking for resources and places of safe and secure shelter and your bug out location would look very attractive uh, particularly as you grow and become more established there so i kind of went on a bit longer than i expected to with that because it is a huge topic to try and cover um but have a little think about it <clears throat> When do you shelter in place? When would you bug out? Um, paying attention if you decide to shelter in place so that you know what the trigger point is uh, when you arrive at a, a decision that it's no longer sustainable and you do need to bug out. Where you're going to go, what resources you need there and to take with you. How do you do that? And more importantly, who do you do that with? Um, at some point I'll probably do a little video on um, bugging out things to consider and I can go into a bit more depth than I did here. Perhaps also um, bug out bags. It's a, it's a famous topic for preppers. Um, what do you have in your bug out bag? Uh, but that's for the future. Uh, for now hopefully that was uh, of use to you. I'm just listening to the rain hitting the roof. I did want to go outside and um, look at those vegetables. <laughs> I suspect both they and I will be extremely wet, but uh, uh, that's it for now for the cabin chat. Well, I did promise, <laughs> so yeah, you can watch me plucking some veggies out in the rain. That's one of the last remaining buckets from uh, the original planting of carrots. So we'll pop those out and see what we've got. Uh, the rain just keeps coming and going, so you're never quite sure. Yeah, some of these are actually still quite small which is a little bit disappointing. I've had a really good harvest of big carrots and these are uh, not quite so big. They will still come in, of course. Quite a lot of them. And that one's not bad size. But this is a definitely smaller than before <laughs> plenty of them and they will still eat there we go there's some bigger ones there quite large There's certainly no shortage of them.
a little people carriage. <laughs> Just keep coming. I think that's about it. Yeah. So there we go, lots and lots and lots of carrots, small but they'll eat. Let's take a look at the beetroot. Well, there we go. That's not too shabby. A little bit smaller, but still eatable. the same again. There are some bigger ones in here. It's whether I want to uh... now that's interesting because that's not a beetroot. That is a small turnip or swede of some kind. <laughs> Anyway, I'll get these cleaned up and then you can take a little look later. Well, there we go. There's uh, <coughs> 35, 36 plus carrots in there. Some of them, as you can see, are hand size, quite nice. Lots of small ones, unfortunately, but it's look of the draw. Beetroot looking quite nice. Perhaps a little bit early for some of these. That's probably where you want to be. Um, <laughs> I don't know how that managed to end up in there, but it's a squeeze or a turnip, uh, but it did. But just interesting to see, I mean, that's a nice size beetroot, and uh, I'll have a little look at that when I get home uh, and get it cooked up. But that's the harvest. As always, carrots done very well. I am really interested to see what happens uh, with these potatoes. They're looking extremely good uh, in terms of being healthy and having strong growth. Uh, and I did bank them up. So hopefully that will turn into a bumper crop later in the year. Anyway, I'm going to get myself sorted out, tidied up. Uh, this rain's not giving in. And uh, I've got a birthday to go to. <laughs> so I'll, get, I'll need to get packed up. Well, that's me heading home. As you can see, the, the weather's not improved at all. But uh, it is always nice to get down to the land, even if it's just for a short while. Well, that's it for this video. I hope there was something in there that was of interest to you. If you did like the video, please do click on the like button. Also, feel free to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already done so. As always, I welcome any comments, questions or suggestions you might have. What are your thoughts on uh, bugging out or sheltering in place and where do you think you would go do you have somewhere have you thought about it let me know in the comments section below but for now thanks for watching and i look forward to seeing you in the next video